Hi, my name is Chris, and I have the privilege of serving as the worship pastor here at the Life Church. Here at TLC, we exist to impact culture through the innovative presentation of Christianity through inspiring people to live a better life. And we are so excited that you have decided to watch from wherever you are tuning in from. If you haven't already, please be sure to like, comment and subscribe. We believe that God has a word just for you. So get your notes ready and let's jump into today's incredible message. Don't miss the door. Uh, I don't know about you all, but any car that I have driven over the last several years, uh, there is an essential feature that it must possess. It must possess the ability for my phone to connect to the car. I could not imagine getting in the car and my phone not having the ability to connect to the car. Uh, this is essential for many of our lives because we know we love to continue the conversation while in commute. Uh, uh, some of us even know we've said this just this past week. You're talking to somebody or, or you're about to talk to somebody and you'll be like, let me call you when I get in the car. Because we love the idea that even in commute, we can still get a call. It's with this in mind that we have to look back at the history because while this feature uh, is for available for all of us, this was not always the case. That the origin story of this particular feature in vehicles started with in 1910. There was a couple who was not even American and they were going on a cross-country trip in 1910. And they decided um, that if they wanted to stay connected to their family, give them updates on their status, they needed to create something that gave them the ability to remain accessible, to remain connected. And so in 1910, this Ericsson couple, which started Ericsson Telecommunications, uh, uh, built the first device that enabled them to stop on the side of the road to make contact with their family on this cross-country trip. Well, fast forward to the 1980s. This is when it became more widely available. This is when cars started to have the big car phone in the middle of the day. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all live long enough to remember the big phone. I'm talking about you had to pick it up, you had to dial, you had to put it up, antenna had to come out. You know what I'm talking about? This, this was a major innovation in the car industry. But watch this, watch this. It was important to understand that we were not the original target audience. That originally it was for business owners and business leaders who felt as if if they were missing calls, they missed the opportunities that could have changed their life. And so they said, we're going to target these people who said missed calls are ruining opportunities of a lifetime. Missed calls are making me miss seasons and windows where everything could shift in my business or my organization. In other words, they could not stand the idea of being disconnected. And I started to wonder how often in our own lives, in our own journeys, in our own commute to the purpose of God in our lives, are we satisfied with seasons of being disconnected? Come on, let's be honest. Some of us couldn't stand being disconnected from others. We take calls all the time, every ride, every drive. But you've lived a whole season not taking a call from God. You, you, you traveled from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. And each place you've shown up, been like, man, I would have never went there if I would have heard God. I'm going to make 12 of y'all mad. You would have never ended up in those last two relationships. If you would have been connected to the call of God, you, you, you wouldn't have took that job. You thought that job looked cute. And then you got there and was like, these people crazy. <laughs> and if only I had heard the call of God. And, and, and I could go on for days about the things that we go from place to place and the destination to destination. And many times we end up there and say, why is this like this? And it could be because the only place we don't mind being disconnected is in our discipleship. And today I want to challenge you that if we are going to respond to the call of God, if we are going to not miss calls, but answer calls, respond to God, we need to understand what that means. Now, I want you to understand what's happening in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet, but he is talking to God in this particular passage. And I think we love the idea of being called. The prophet Isaiah says, the Lord calls out, who shall I send? And this is one of the most clear passages of scripture of somebody answering the call of God. He says, send me, Lord. I'll go. Now, this sounds good. Like a lot of times we read the Bible, we love to put ourselves in it as the ideal character. 
Come on, let's be honest. We'd be like, I would be Isaiah. <laughs> but can I tell you what he does not know when he answers the call? Who's going with him? He doesn't know what the task will be. He doesn't know every turn, every twist. He doesn't know the final destination. He just knows I'm saying yes to God, and I don't know what the journey will bring. I just know that if he called me, he's going to be with me. And, and, and can many of us be honest? We're cool with answering God's call as long as he gives us preferred details. God, I'm cool with saying yes, but who the people you sending with me? Because if my people can't go. God, I'm cool with saying yes to your call, but what's the profit attached to the job? God, I'm cool with it, but, but, but what's the promotion going to look like? And if any of us be honest, we often filter our yes through details that we demand of God that we may not have when he asks us, will you say yes? It's with this in mind that we need to understand what does it mean to answer the call? I want to teach a little bit today because I want us to understand this in its totality. The answer the call, the definition I want to give you today about what it means to answer a call is this. It means a person is following the instruction of God. Hear me for themselves, others, and their unique assignment. That's it. What does it mean to answer the call of God? It means you are following the instructions of God for yourself, for others, and for the unique assignment you have been called to. This is important. You are following the instruction of God because it is one thing to hear instructions. It is another thing to follow them. Okay, two amens and a clap. Okay, let me talk to y'all over here. Y'all need this word. Um, if you have children, you know this to be true. That there are very often times where you know you were clear in your instruction. And then you walk by their room and say, I know what I said, but what I see doesn't look like they followed my instruction. Can I ask you a question? If God were to look at your life, would he say you heard me and you listened? Or would he just say you like talking? <laughs> Come on, everybody got one friend. Somebody say one friend. Who want to be on the phone just to talk. You know they're not going to do nothing with the wisdom you give them. <laughs> you know. You know this is an hour of just exercise. <laughs> because it's easy to hear. It's another thing to listen. This is why in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22, the half-brother of Jesus says this message to re-engage re or reinforce his brother's teaching. Look at what he says in James, chapter 1. He says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are fooling who? Yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what? you look like. Because watch this. God's voice is not just trying to help you discover who he is. He's also speaking to you to help you discover who you are. And when you start getting a word from God, even if it scares you, even if it doesn't look like what you expected for your life, you need to understand God never speaks if he's not trying to reveal to you another version of you. And when you hear his voice for you, and then you turn away from it, you don't just dishonor him. You dishonor the future that he set aside for you. He said, you walk away and forget what you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to become and what you look like. And if I'm being honest, as I was preparing for this sermon, Ryan, I, I was thinking to myself, I was going to have a slide up here that said purpose versus calling. Because that's what I thought it was. I thought calling and purpose were kind of two different things. Until I begin to study, and now what I've discovered is that purpose is actually on the spectrum of calling. Can I teach a little bit? I want you to understand today that there are three calls that all of us receive. Three calls that all of us receive. The first one is a call to Christ. It's a salvation. We preached about this last week, that every one of us is a son and a daughter. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. All of us are called to Christ. He is calling you. The moment that he gave his life on Calvary, it was an eternal call for you to be able to come back home. Not only, though, are we called to Christ, we are called to ministry. Now, I know some of y'all was like, not me. <laughs> but we got to be careful because the word ministry in the New Testament is not used how we use it today in Western theology. That it's not just about clergy college and sitting in the front. 
that we all are called to minister, to serve, is the word in the New Testament, to help the body, to help people. You're saying, well, Vernon, I don't know all the scriptures. Yeah, but you know your story. Yeah, but I don't know all them songs. Yeah, but you know your story. And your story may just be what somebody needs to be able to change everything in their life. What ministry? Let me go to all of us are called to serve others. It is the Great Commission. It is not a call to some of us. It is a call to all of us who are a part of the family of Christ. But then there's this third one. We are called to a unique assignment, which is what we call purpose. We are called to purpose. We see this in the scripture really quick. I'm going to go through this. Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to see this for your own theological foundation. What is it saying? Verse 1. So I, a prisoner of the Lord, appeal to you, live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That is do what? Live a life that exhibits character and courage and personal integrity and mature behavior. Somebody y'all say, I need to send this text message to a friend. Just be like, mature behavior, baby. We growing up. We growing up. Look at verse 4. There is one body of believers in one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when called to what? Salvation. So that's the call to Christ. Then the Great Commission tells us we're called to ministry. And then in verse 16, I love this, Ephesians 4, 16, he, he starts to tell us between 11 and 16 the various gifts that he gives to the church, the different ways in which we all are uniquely put together. And then look at what he says. He says, from him, the whole body, the church, and its various parts, that's you and I, joined and knitted firmly together by what every joint supplies. When each part is working properly, causes the body to grow and mature, building itself up in unselfish love. Here it is. He's saying that every gift that God has placed inside of you, the, the, the anointing he's placed on your life, the, the unique quirks that you don't even like, that you don't understand yet, every part of you, the various parts of all of us, work together to express love to the body, to express love to each other. Watch this. This is why you have to be careful taking instructions from other people's insecurity. Because if you're not careful, you will take instructions because some people will be intimidated by your awareness of your giftedness. Come hear me. Just because you're aware of how you're gifted does not mean you're arrogant. It means that you have enough awareness to know that, baby, I'm just doing what I've been called to do. And when you are aware of your call, you show up in the best version of yourself and you express love to the body. This is why the enemy wants to shower you with insecurity. Here it is. Because if you stay insecure, you are busy trying to develop somebody else's gift. While neglecting the one he gave you. And the body suffers. You are called, uniquely called, gifted. God has placed something on you and in you. And we need you, not somebody else, to show up. What, what has he given you? What has he called you to do? How has he called you to show up? Now, here's the problem. Can I tell you the problem? Somebody say the problem. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. I want to paint attention for you. Here's the problem. The problem in culture right now is that we think the most important thing to discover is purpose. Yeah, make somebody mad today. We, we have, we, look at social media. Look at modern media. We will buy a book about purpose. We will share a, a, a video about purpose. All of us want to discover our purpose. And there's no problem with that. That is one of the calls of God. The danger is we end up checking the first box, salvation. And then we want to skip over ministry. I'm not called to that. So I can arrive at purpose. So we devalue being called close to Christ. So we say, let me jump to being used, but I haven't been close. And then we say, well, 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 I don't want to serve other people. I don't want to show up on Fifth Sunday. I don't need to be on a dream team. I don't, because that doesn't take a unique gift. That's all of our responsibility. And we say, but, but let me just get to the thing where God uses me uniquely. And we got to be careful because time and time again, if we're not careful, we will find ourselves trying to build our purpose, but missing out on who and what God has called us to first. You ever, you ever met somebody, you ever met somebody um, um, who, who got a new thing and then they forgot about all the old things? Come on. All right. Let me just talk to 12 people real quick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, let me, let, me, let me show you how to show it up in Scripture. Uh, let me show you how to show it up in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, this is what Paul writes to a community. He says this. He says, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy. Here it is. Just stay on 26. When God called you. 
He was like, you want all that? <laughs> when he called you. You, you want hot? When he called you. Right? And, and we all know people like this. We all know people like this. Um, like, they get a new thing, and then they forget about all the old things. Like, they get a new pair of shoes, and then they are like the only shoes they got. Come on, like, you know what I'm talking about. They get them new drays, or they get them new shoes, and then every day they find a reason to wear that. Like, 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 like can I be honest with y'all? I am heat. I ain't scared of y'all. I just got this new pair of Adidas recently, some Yeezys, and I've been wearing them crazy. I, I done wore them to the gym. I wear them to the mailbox. I wear them to the back to school night. Y'all laughing. My wife is weak right now because I wear these shoes to death. I have completely forgotten that I got a closet of other shoes. If I get a new thing, you better believe. I get a new blazer, every suit is going to match that blazer. Pair of jeans with the blazer. Because I got something new. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because often in our lives, we get something new and we forget what was and what got us here. And so, so you get the new opportunity, but you forget the relationship that guided you to it. You, 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 you get the, the, the new level of influence, but you forget the wisdom that helped you sustain the last level of influence. And, and I'm trying to help somebody understand what Paul was trying to help them understand. He said, hey, God is going to use you. God is going to give you purpose. God is going to give you opportunity. God is going to give you influence. But be careful. Because very often what can happen is God gives you a new season and a new thing and new purpose. But then what happens is you start moving in purpose and then you forget the people who you needed to get there. You also need on the other side. You still need accountability. Hello. You still need wisdom. Watch out. You still need friends who tell you the truth. Here it is. And just because you got new friends on the other side of that door doesn't mean the old friends can't help you sustain your character on the other side. You need not forget. That before he called you, you weren't all that. Look at what he said in verse 27. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. He chose the things that were powerless to shame those who were powerful. God chose things despised by the world. God chose you when they didn't like you. God chose you when you didn't have all the degrees. God chose you before you had all the money. God chose you before they affirmed you. God said he chose you even when you might have been counted out. And use you to bring something to the world that's important. Here it is. This is what verse 29 says. And as a result, no one can boast in the presence of God. In other words, God didn't do all of this because he just wants to, 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 to take you from here to there. He did it because he wants to use you in new environments and new seasons and wants to evolve your purpose in every season. But you can't forget about who bought you. To that place. And, and if we're not careful, purpose only becomes a problem when we misplace priorities. Purpose only becomes a problem when we misplace priorities. I'm about to talk about for these last 20 minutes all the ways you start to find your purpose and become all that God has called you to be. But for these first 20 minutes, I just want you to understand that if you get purpose right, but you get priorities wrong, you're in a problematic place. God is still the priority. Watch this. That who I am always comes second to who I'm created for. Who I am, who I am, what I'm doing, all that he's called me to comes second to who I created for. And the tension of this text in Isaiah and the tension of every call throughout scripture is this really simple truth that we have to cling to today. And it's this, that if you have the ability to answer calls, you also have the ability to ignore them. So you got to be careful not to ignore the calls of God. I don't know if anybody uh, on their phone loves the Do Not Disturb feature. Some of y'all love it too much. Come on. Some of y'all hands went up quick. We're like, thank you, Lord, for that. My God. I, I was <laughs> looking at my phone the other day, and, uh, and I, I was looking at all these focus features that I have. And, uh, and I just put an image up on the screen. And, um, and this is my phone. This is my literal phone. Uh, like, these are the settings I have uh, when I want to focus. I have a general do not disturb. And I got personal. Then I got one that's just for study, driving, you know, work, sleep. Um, and then you can add a new focus. And, and I got real convicted. Can I tell you why I got convicted? Because I was like, man, I got an intentional way to focus on doing everything in my life. But God does not. Like, I don't have a space intentionally created in this feature that says, and this is time to be undisturbed so I can hear him. 
And this may seem small to you. I'm not saying that you have to have this on your phone. I'm saying I was convicted that I intentionally have went in and customized creating space to be productive in every way. Do I create space to hear his voice? Recently came in contact with this quote that I thought was powerful for me. Maybe it will be for you. Hearing God's voice is not a waste of time, but it takes time. Oh, don't miss it. Hearing God's voice is never a waste of time. But if you're going to hear God's voice, it takes time. What time is set aside in your life to actually hear the call of God? If he is calling, do you have the space to answer the call? And we can often miss the call of God for many reasons. Disobedience, comfort, stubbornness, fear. But, but here's one that I think is most common that I want to just speak to today, and it's going to offend 12 of y'all, but don't walk out. Are you ready? Ignorance. Like many of us be honest, and I want to tell you, I say this with empathy. We just don't know how to hear the voice of God. Like we leave church moments like these, and what do we say? Just listen to his voice, and then you're like, okay, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> what does it sound like? <laughs> like, do it sound like Obama or uh, does it sound like, like, ooh, sound like Socrates? Like, what, what does it sound like? And so I think one of the great dangers of the faith is even if you want to pursue purpose, you say, God has called me to something. If I don't know how to hear his voice, what do I do? Now, I want to encourage you, you're not alone in this. Elijah faced the same thing. And here's what I love. This is going to help some of you who have been walking with God for a while because it is very possible to know God's voice in one season and then be in a new season and want him to speak the same way he used to. And sometimes our issue is not that God is not speaking. It's just that we only can hear him the way he used to talk. 1 Kings 19, look at what it says. He said, here, he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord. But the people of Israel broke their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. So look at what he says, verse 11. Okay, he said, go out and stand before me on the mountain. So the Lord told him to do that. He said, okay, I'm going to go stand there. Then it says, the Lord passed by. Now I want you to see this. I'm going to just summarize this really quick. There was a windstorm. He was like, that must be God. He was like, nope, not him. There was an earthquake. Must be God. Not him. There was fire. Must be God, not him. And then it said there was a sound of a gentle whisper. That was the moment. Elijah knew it was the voice of God, which means it is absolutely impossible for God to be speaking, but you to be confining him to a previous way that he got your attention. Sometimes he roars loud. Sometimes he's quiet. And with this in mind, that I believe that there are seven languages of God. This is taken straight from a book. I want to encourage you to get it. It's been helpful to me by Mark Batterson called Whisper. And he talks about the seven languages of God, the seven ways God's voice shows up in our life. I want you to write these down because it is very possible that God is speaking to you. He's calling out to you. And you're just missing his call because you've only known one way. Here's the first one. Here's the first one. The first language of God is scripture. Somebody say scripture. Scripture, this is important, this is important. Scripture is the first language of God, and it is the primary language of God. Why? Because we don't just read the Bible, the Bible reads us. Yeah. That The Bible is the eternal word of God. It is the voice of God speaking to, out, out to us from generation to generation, and it is consistent, and it is the way in which God has always talked to his sons and daughters. It is living and active, the Bible says, as sharp as a two-edged sword. It is constantly speaking to us. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to somebody who isn't. I'm going to say it again. Y'all missed it. A Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to somebody who isn't. That when you are in Scripture and you are in God's Word, it gives you a foundation and a stability that when the winds blow and the rain comes, it says, man, I would fall apart, but his word is undergirding me. He is speaking to us always through Scripture, and this is the primary language of God. Every other language that we're about to explore, hear me, must be interpreted through Scripture. Otherwise, hear me, you can run the risk of manipulating these other ones to say what you want them to say. But if it is not confirmed in the word of God, 
You got to come back to the drawing board. Are y'all hearing me? Scripture is the first language. Here it is, second one. Desires is one of the ways God's voice shows up. I'm going to go through these quickly. I think I'm going to do a whole Bible study on these coming up soon. I'm, 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 I'm going to make sure we do something with this. Desires. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, this word give here in the Hebrew is the word conceive. What it means is the closer I get to God, the more there will start to be desires in me that are birthed or conceived that are in alignment with his will and his way. If you've ever been connected to somebody who's eating healthy and you weren't, <laughs> y'all just gonna act like it was just me. Come on, everybody got a one healthy friend, you know what I'm saying? They be like, you wanna try this? Nah, I don't. <laughs> Actually, but I'm here. <laughs> Go for it. But, but if you've ever stayed consistent and if you've ever been faithful and you've ever started to see the fruit of healthy eating, you start to have a desire for things you did not originally have a desire for because as you grow closer to a lifestyle and as you grow closer to a person, your desires start to shift. And God is saying that part of what happens as you grow close to me is that your desires will start to shift and your desires will start to become indications that, hey, maybe this is where I'm calling you to. It's important to understand. You may say, hey, man, I joined the church, and I never had a desire to serve on a dream team before. But now, as I have gotten more connected, now I have a new desire. Or maybe you're saying, man, I never was burdened by that before. But now, as I continue to drive by there, and this word is impacting my life, and I've been reading scripture about doing good works in Titus and James 2, where it says faith without works is dead. Maybe I'm drawn to some communities to serve and some nonprofits and some outreaches in a way that I wasn't. But my desires are now a reflection of God calling me into a new expression of purpose. Yeah. Number three, number three, dreams are one of the ways God calls out to us. Now, some of you, you have dreams at night, and I want to encourage you. Maybe you're saying, man, I'm a dreamer. I dream in the middle of the night, and I, I can sense God speaking to me. And I want you to wake up, and this is important to journal those dreams, right? Some of us don't know what to do. What, what do I do if I'm dreaming, and I feel like this dream is more than just what I ate last night, but it's something significant, right? Okay, what is this? But you wake up, you journal that. No matter what time, here it is. This is really key. No matter what time God wakes you up. Because sometimes God is speaking, and if he wakes you up, it's because there is an assignment. There's something that he wants you to remember, he wants you to reveal or to the earth. And so you got to say, hey, I want to take this down. I want to journal it. I want to be clear about what he's saying. So some of us dream in the night. Some of us daydream. Yeah. Now, let me help you. I'm not talking about, okay. <laughs> I'm not talking about you being lazy at work because you're like, <laughs> you was like, thank you, God. I knew I wasn't supposed to be paying attention to my supervisor because <laughs> they just be talking. They don't be saying nothing, Vernon. I'm supposed to be listening to God. No, 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 no. Finish that project on that deadline. Amen. God bless you. Pay them bills. Amen. That's God's will for your life. Don't you lose that job because the Lord told you to dream. <laughs> Are you supposed to be in a meeting? <laughs> no, what happens here? There are dreams in your heart that you just can't let go of. Like, like vision that you keep seeing. You're like, man, no, I'm seeing something in the earth. I'm seeing something that God is calling me to do. Something that God is calling me. This is a dream. And for many of us, we've lived this, that you work a nine to five, but then you have a five to nine because the dream is so alive and the dream is so well that you say, no, I got to respond to this because this feels like more than just my desire. This feels like more than just a, a youthful aspiration. This feels like something God is calling me to do. Yeah. Right? You got to respond to the dreams of God, sometimes the call. Here's another one. Here's another one. Then you're not going to like this one. Tap your name on the list. So you're not going to like this one. You're not going to like this one. People is one of the ways God calls out to you. I knew y'all weren't going to like this one. People. That very often, God uses people to be a catalyst for your call. God used a prophet named Nathan to rebuke David. Because watch this, he doesn't just use people to tell you the things you like. Sometimes he's calling out to you to get some things corrected. And this is why you got to be careful because you can ignore the voice of God unless he's saying something that you prefer. But he said, no, I'm calling Nathan to get you together. Watch this. He used an uncle named Mordecai to, to exhort Queen Esther. He used a spiritual father named Paul to encourage Timothy. God wants to speak to others through you, but don't miss this. He also wants to speak to you through others. That sometimes we are missing the call of God because here it is. We have too much pride to let people speak into our life. 
that we have not cultivated enough humility to let God speak through people. This happened to me firsthand. Some of you may know, but maybe not all of you, that prior to us planting the Life Church, uh, my wife and I had the privilege of being youth pastors at a church in Mosley, Virginia called Spring Creek Baptist Church. And it was an amazing season of our life. We were recently married, and we spent the first five years of full-time ministry in that church. But the way that came about was so unique. Uh, I had a friend who knew uh, the vice president of the psychology department because she was studying in psychology. And not only was the pastor of that church uh, a senior pastor, but he was a psychology professor at VCU. So she says to me, I don't even know I'm going to meet a pastor. She says, hey, I want you to come and meet my mentor, uh, to come to his office. So we went and I introduced myself to him and he found out I preached. And so he said, you preached a sermon last week? I said, yeah, I told him about the sermon. And then he said, oh, you gonna preach that in my church this Sunday? I said, no, I'm not. I got plans. He said, okay, cool. The next day he called me again. He said, hey, you clear your plans? I said, no, I just met you. I'm not doing that. He called me every day for four days and said, hey, I'm gonna see you this Sunday, right? Finally, I went to the pastor I was serving at. Many of you, some of you know from Chesapeake, Virginia, Bishop Ken Brown, Mount Lebanon Church. I was serving there as a worship leader. And so I said, hey, Bishop Brown, I, you, this guy just keeps calling me. Keep telling me that I'm gonna preach at his church this Sunday. Are you cool with it? He said, yeah, you should go. You should do it. So I went. I preached at this church. Then he said, hey, man, we got New Year's Eve coming up. I think you should come and you should co-host New Year's Eve with me. I said, okay, cool, sure. So I came and did that. And then he said, hey, man, you're going to be my youth pastor. I said, no, I'm not. I, I, ain't, I ain't apply <laughs> for no youth pastor position. He said, no, 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 no. You're you going to be my new youth pastor. And he called me and kept calling and kept calling. And kept calling. Watch this. Because he saw something in my purpose. And in my potential. And in my future. That I could not yet see in myself. And if he stopped calling. You may not be sitting in the life church today. Because I didn't see this. But he saw something before I did. I'm trying to help you to understand today. That sometimes you will experience a call through people. That they're helping you to see the next version of yourself. People, people, okay, okay, I'm gonna go through these next two real quick. Next two real quick. You also experience the call of God, watch this, through promptings. Isaiah 30, 21 says, whether you turn to the right or left, your ears or voice will be behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. What Isaiah is saying is that the Holy Spirit will often guide you. It will nudge you. Here's what I love to think about it as. Scripture is a map, but the Holy Spirit is our guide. Sometimes you're following the word, you're following people, you're following instruction. But you're like, man, I need a nudge. I need a spirit to prompt me to say, hey, have you ever like text somebody or call somebody and say, hey, I just felt led to check on you. And they said, man, I really needed that. That's what we consider a prompting. I feel prompted to stop here. I feel prompted to call this person. And you need to respond to the prompting of the Lord. Sometimes God is trying to get your attention and call out to you through a prompting. All right, here's, here's, here's number six. Here's number six. Oh, you're not going to like this one either. Ooh. I'm going to go talk to y'all over here. Y'all look real nice. Here's, here's the sixth one. This is the way God calls out to us. Pain. Like God sometimes calls to us through our pain. C.S. Lewis says this. He says that God whispers through our pleasures, but he shouts through our pain. Now hear me. I don't want you to have an improper theology today. I am not saying God causes the pain. What I'm saying is that very often pain can be a conduit for us to be more inclined to hear his voice. Because how many of us can testify to the fact that when everything is going good in life, we get a little busy for God. And when everything is ideal, we might not be always listening for his voice. But when things get hard and when things start hurting and when pain appears, we start saying, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? And our ears begin to open up to his voice in a unique way. And what I'm trying to tell you today is that the pain may not be caused by God, but God will come into the pain and have a conversation with you so that you don't lose him when you go into the valley. He will say, daughter, son, I know I'm with you on the mountain, but baby, I'm also with you in the valley. That in pain, we can hear the voice of God. Why is this important? Because sometimes it's in pain that purpose is discovered. Many of you know, I'm a former cancer patient. Two tumors, 14 surgeries, three years of chemo. He told me I would die three times. It was in some of my pain that I found some of my purpose. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But it was in those moments when God showed up that I learned things about God and about myself that I never would have discovered if I didn't invite his voice into the pain. Here's the last one. Here's the last one. Last way God calls out to us. You ready? Last way God calls out to us. 
is through doors. Somebody say doors. Say doors, say doors, say doors. That, that, that he opens doors. Revelation tells us that he opens doors that no man can shut. But here's what the verse also says. And he shuts doors that nobody can open. Ah, some of y'all ain't read the whole verse. You were like, that's the part right there. He opens doors that no man can shut. And shuts doors that nobody can open. What am I saying? That he's the God of closed doors and open doors. Do you trust him with both? Because sometimes you will close the door because you want it was on the other side. But if you got there, you recognize, I really didn't want that at all. But he also opens doors. And here's what I've come to find. This is why we got to be careful with doors. Because God can open them, but there are different ways to enter them. And very often, if many of us be honest, we talk about the power of exits, but we don't talk about the principles of entry. That there are different ways to enter different doors. And you're saying, Vernon, I want to pursue my purpose. I want to go to the next level. I'm hearing God's voice through a door that is open, an opportunity that has shown itself. Okay, here's what I want you to understand. There are different ways to go through the door. And there are three primary doors that show up when you are pursuing purpose. Here's the first door. The first one is a locked door. Somebody say locked doors. The, the, the locked door, the locked door, watch this. If you're going to get in it, if you're going to go through it, you need keys. In other words, you need principles that open the door. What are principles, Vernon? Okay, I'm glad you asked. You need the word of God. You need wisdom. Some of you have been standing at a door and you're mad at God that it didn't open. He said, I'm not going to open it until you take wisdom through with you. Because if you don't go through with wisdom, you're just going to mess up what's on the other side. And so for some of us, we're saying, why won't this door open? God called me to it. He said, but I'm not going to let you through it until you take wisdom along, until you become more humble, until you let pride go down so that I can show up. He says, what are you taking through with you? For some of us, here it is. The Bible says some things only come by prayer and fasting. It's a principle. So the door might not be opening. And could it be? It's because you haven't put in practice the principles, the keys that open the door. Lock doors, lock doors. Watch this. Not only do we see locked doors. I love this one. We have revolving doors. My kids love revolving doors. You know, I go to restaurants and, um, and they play a game. Like they try to figure out how many of them can fit in the revolving door at one time. They try to jump in like it's double dutch. You know what I'm saying? Like, ooh, the revolving doors, revolving doors. Revolving doors. And, and if you know anything about revolving doors, they work. But only if you jump in at the right time. I'm trying to help you today. Because some of us have been frustrated with our season and it's because you jumped in too late. Or you could have jumped in too early. And this is why Holy Spirit being a God is so critical. Because if you jump in a season prematurely, watch this, you show up unprepared for the promise. So you got great ideas, but you don't have enough emotional intelligence to deal with the pe people and personalities. You, you got in there but your patience wasn't ready for the promise. You, you, you got in the role, but your disciplines weren't ready for the pace. And very often, we get into a next season of purpose and potential, but because we were so ready to get there, we jump ahead of God. But then there's also the danger of missing a season. We jump in late, and when we jump in late, Watch this, we end up with regrets. Come on, anybody ever been here before? We're like, man, I should have, I should have responded to God. I should have answered the call. I should have said, here I am, send me. But, but if I'm being honest, I was afraid. And so insecurity kept me on the other side of the door. Fear kept me on the other side of the door. And now I'm frustrated because I'm seeing others walking in promise and purpose in a way that I could have. But I let the enemy's strategy get in the way of me jumping in at the right time. Can I tell you what I love about God? He's a redeemer, though. And so even if you miss the door in the last season, that thing is going to come back around. And baby, I declare somebody to say, I'll be ready when it comes back around. I won't miss it a second time. Yeah, I was scared last year, but if it comes back around, I'm jumping in. Yep, our insecurity got me the last time, but I'm going to jump in this time. That I refuse to allow the purpose of God to pass me by. I'm jumping in. Here's the last thing. You have automatic doors. I love these. I love these. I see them at the grocery store. I see them everywhere. 
automatic doors work not when you jump in at the right time not with keys but Brittany automatic doors work when you just get close enough I ain't got to do nothing I just got to get there I ain't got to figure it out I just got to get there I just got to take one step forward. I just got to put one foot in front of the other. I just got to keep waking up and doing the right stuff. I'm here to let somebody know today, I think this is a season for doors opening in your life. I think this is a season where God says, just get close. Just keep moving. Just keep pressing. Just keep pushing. Just keep being disciplined. And if you get close enough, I'm going to open up a door that no man can shut. I came to preach to 50 people who've been trying to figure out what God's doing next. God said, just get close. Just get close. Just just get close just get close keep walking keep praying keep fasting keep pushing keep doing it get close and watch me do what no man could have done and when you look back you're gonna see God open that door but you can't get to purpose if you miss the call if you don't hear his voice closing with this I, 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 I have something an issue that some of you may deal with I'm closing with this maybe it's just me but I have a condition called selective hearing I've been diagnosed by my wife which means it's real <laughs> but I did some research and this is actually a very real thing it's actually in, in, in the medical industry called selective auditory attention it is actually a normal brain function. Now, husbands, that does not mean you can ignore your wife today watching the game. I'm not saying that. But it actually is the brain's response to helping you focus on one voice when many voices are in the room. It is why you have the ability to hear the conversation with a person across the dinner table, even though there are 30 other conversations happening in the restaurant. It is the reason why you can be at a concert with all that noise and still lean over and hear the whisper of a friend. It's because your brain is giving you the ability to focus on one voice in the midst of many voices. I'm here to let you know today that this is a season for you to get clear with this voice. This is a season to say, I need to hear him above my friends. I need to hear him above my family. I need to hear him above my past. I need to hear him above my feelings. I need to hear him above everything that would seek to steal, kill, and destroy the promises of God over my life and if you can focus on his voice you won't miss the door but very often we miss the door because we hear too many voices but this is the invitation today get more selective say I might not know what you think but I know what he thinks I, I might not like what you said but I know what he said I'm not gonna miss the door because I know his voice would you stand on your feet all across this room? I want to pray for you really quickly. Maybe today you feel like you missed a door in the last season. Maybe, maybe you feel like you missed a season or a window. Maybe, maybe you feel like you're on the cusp of something new. I'm pursuing my purpose. I'm discovering who God has called me to be. And I just want to invite you today, whatever that looks like, it's time to respond. For some of you, respond is going to look like getting in and pursuing purpose. They just finished week one, jump in. You say, man, I, I got to get caught up because that's where I'm at in my life. For some of you, you might be saying, man, I, I'm just insecurity and fear have really robbed me of jumping in at the right time. But no more. Whatever that may be, I want you to know, God is still calling. He cares about you. He loves you and he's ready for you to respond and there's one other thing I want to offer you today and that's an invitation to the call of Christ it's the first call we talked about it is the most important I want you to achieve purpose I want you to do all that God has called you to be but the first thing I want for each and every one of us is to receive and answer the call to Christ so if everybody could close their eyes for 30 seconds if that's you in the room today you're saying God is calling me. Maybe you feel like, man, I've been imperfect. I, I haven't gotten it all right. Can I tell you something? That's okay. That's okay. Because the church is not a bunch of perfect people. It's a bunch of imperfect people who found a perfect God. Maybe you're saying, man, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. There's no way God would want me. I'm telling you right now today, he does. He loves you. 
That's why the Bible tells us he gave his only son to die for our sins, our struggles, and mistakes. So if that's you, you say, I want to give my life to Christ. We're going to say a simple prayer in a moment. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to Christ. You were in a relationship with God, but you say, man, I, if I'm being honest, I've slid off track. I'm not aligned, but I want to get back on track. On the count of three, you can just lift that hand in the air. Nobody's looking at you. Nobody's going to ask you to say anything or do anything. You say, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to rededicate my life to Christ. Just lift that hand in the air. One, two, three. Hands are already going up. We see you. We see you. Heaven sees 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 you. Yes, Lord. Heaven sees you. Now we're going to say this prayer together because you're not alone. And we're one body. So repeating after me, we all say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and getting up for my freedom. I decide to follow you. I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this message here at the Life Church. We pray that it continues to encourage you. We exist to impact culture through the innovative presentation of Christianity through inspiring people to live a better life. And if you would like to partner with us in giving, you can text your dollar amount to 84321 or visit us on our website. Be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and even go check out our other content as well. And don't forget, join us every Sunday online or in person. We'll see you next time. God bless.